Grinch. Greetings, friends, horror fans, lovers of the occult. Welcome to the inaugural... Let's get some fucking atmosphere in here, please. There we are. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Grinch After Midnight. Those of you familiar with the Grinch 1984 channel, you may remember, those of you who were with me from the beginning, and I'm not talking 2012 when I started the damn thing, I'm talking about a few months ago when I actually started to put content out there. Uh, it was all over the place, so Grinch 1984 is a parody channel now. I mean, we might dabble in, in, in some more of the, the, the series that I had started and never finished, never took anywhere. My son seems to love roomies. So if you guys happen to find roomies on, on the channel, check it out. It's Kevin and Gerald, two idiots. But since that has sort of navigated towards the parodies and, and the funny shit, sometimes some serious shit, uh, I, I wanted to have a channel where I could just do what I want, speak to the adults, and a channel that my son won't see, and I want to read some fucking scary shit, okay? I don't want to have to censor myself. I want to talk to the to the the big kids. Okay. So, what we're gonna do on Grinch After Midnight is every Friday I'm going to read a series of stories, short stories that I have found. If you want to submit some, get at me in the comments. Uh, if uh, you want to um, hear anything that has been done before, you just want me to read it because maybe you think I haven't read it send it my way, anything you want. I don't take credit for any of these stories, I just want to share them with you. These happen to be ones that I've found. I've got a good stockpile of them already, but uh, we're going to do about 10 per week. We're going to do every Friday night, and then I'm going to upload it after midnight, which I guess technically is Saturday morning, but who the fuck's counting, you know? It's Friday night. It's, it's Friday night until we go to bed, so if you're up past midnight, which, good God, it's 10.30, I don't have much time to edit, do I? Uh, if you're up past midnight, then let's, uh, let's read these stories. So we're going to do about 10 a week, and uh, there's 30 in here, so that's three weeks. So I'm going to need some stories, so if you have any suggestions, let's do it. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to scour Reddit for some of the best uh, creepy twist ending stories, and I'll try to give credit where I can. Some of these uh, are anonymous, so you know, if, if you own the story that I'm reading and you want credit, let me know after the fact. Uh, I'm sorry if I didn't get to it ahead of the fact because I just don't know. The internet is kind of a free-for-all when it comes to short little two-minute stories, um, just the nature of the beast. So um, I'm, I'm claiming uh, artistic license on these and I'm going to give them kind of my own voice. So without talking your ear off, which I know I tend to do, uh, let's get into it. Number 10, this new old house. We bought an old house, my boyfriend and I. He's in charge of the new construction, converting the kitchen into the master bedroom, for instance, while I'm on wallpaper removal duty. The previous owner papered every wall and ceiling. Removing it is brutal, but oddly satisfying. The best feeling is getting a long peel, similar to your skin when you're peeling from a sunburn. I don't know about you, but I kind of make a game of peeling, on the hunt for the longest piece before it rips. Under a corner section of paper in every room is a person's name and a date. Curiosity got the best of me one night when I googled one of the names and discovered the person was actually a missing person. The missing date matching the date under the wallpaper. The next day, I made a list of all the names and dates. Sure enough, each name was from a missing person, with dates to match. We notified the police, who naturally sent out a crime scene team. I overheard one tech say, yup, it's human. Human? What's human? Ma'am, where is the material you removed from the walls already? This isn't wallpaper you were removing. Get it? It's human skin. Number two. I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. My parents constantly try to explain to me how sick he is, that I am lucky for having a brain where all the chemicals flow properly to 
to their destinations like undammed rivers. When I complain about how bored I am without a little brother to play with, they try to make me feel bad by pointing out that his boredom likely far surpasses mine. Considering his, con his confine, I didn't say these were perfect, I didn't write them. Considering he is confined to a dark room in an institution. I guess that is right, considering his confined to a dark room in an institution. These episodes will get better. It's the first one. Sorry. So his brother's in an institution. I always beg for them to give him one last chance. Of course, they did it first. Charlie had been back home several times, each shorter in duration than the last. Each time without fail, it all starts again. The neighborhood cats with gouged out eyes showing up in his toy chest. My dad's razors found dropped on the baby slide in the park across the street. Mom's vitamins replaced by bits of dishwasher tablets. My parents are hesitant now, using last chances sparingly. They say his disorder makes him charming, makes it easy for him to fake normalcy, and to trick the doctors who care for him into thinking he is ready for rehabilitation every time. That I will just have to put up with my boredom if it means staying safe from him. I hate it when Charlie has to go away. It makes me have to pretend to be good until he is back. Guardians. He awoke to the huge insect-like creatures looming over his bed and screamed his lungs out. They hastily left the room and he stayed up all night, shaking and wondering if it had been a dream. The next morning, there was a tap on the door. Gathering his courage, he opened it to see one of them gently place a plate filled with fried breakfast on the floor, then retreat to a safe distance. Bewildered, he accepted the gift. The creatures chittered excitedly. This happened every day for weeks. At first, he was worried they were fattening him up, but after a particularly greasy breakfast left him clutching his chest from heartburn, they were replaced with fresh fruit. As well as cooking, they poured hot, steamy baths for him and even tucked him in when he went to bed. It was bizarre. One night he awoke to gunshots and screaming. He raced downstairs to find a decapitated burglar being devoured by the insects. He was sickened, but disposed of the remains as best he could. He knew that they had just been protecting him. One morning the creatures wouldn't let him leave his room. He lay down, confused but trusting, as they ushered him back into bed. Whatever their motives, they weren't going to hurt him. Hours later, a burning pain spread throughout his body. It felt like his stomach was filled with razor wire. The insects chittered as he spasmed and moaned. It was only when he felt a terrible squirming feeling beneath his skin that he realized the insects hadn't been protecting him. They have been protecting their young. Number four. Seeing red, or the first day of school. Everybody loves the first day of school, right? New year, new classes, new friends. It's a day full of potential and hope. Before all the dreary depressions of reality show up to ruin all the fun. I like the first day of school. For a different reason, though. You see, I have a sort of power. When I look at people, I can sense a sort of aura around them, a colored outline, if you will, based on how long that person has left to live. Most everyone I meet around my age is surrounded by a solid green hue, which means they have plenty of time left. A fair amount of them have a yellow, orangish hue to their auras which tends to mean a car crash or some other tragedy is on the horizon. Anything that takes people before their time, as they say. 
The real fun is when the auras venture into the red end of the spectrum, though. Every now and again, I'll see someone who's basically a walking stoplight. Those are the ones who get murdered or kill themselves. It's such a rush to see them and know that their time is numbered. With that in mind, I always get to class very early so I can scout out my classmates' fates. The first kid who walked in was basically radiating red. I chuckled to myself, too damn bad, bro. But as people kept walking in, they all had the same intense glow. I finally caught a glimpse of my rose-tinted reflection in the window, but I was too stunned to move. Our professor stepped in and locked the door his aura, a sickening shade of green. Number five. They got the definition wrong. It has been said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. I understand the sentiment behind the saying, but it's wrong. I uh, entered the building on a bet. I was strapped for cash, and I didn't buy into the old legends of the hotel to begin with. So 50 bucks was more than enough to get me to do it. It was simple. Just reach the top floor, the 45th floor, shine my flashlight from a window. The hotel was old and broken, including the elevator. So that meant hiking up the stairs. So up the stairs I went. Uh, as I reached each platform, I noticed the old brass plaques displaying the floor numbers, 15, 16, 17, 18. I felt a little tired as I crept higher, but so far, no ghosts, no cannibals, no demons. Piece of cake. I can't tell you how happy I was when I entered that last stretch of numbers. I joyfully counted them aloud at each platform, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 44, I stopped and looked back down the stairs. I must have miscounted. So I continued up. 44. One more flight. 44. And then down 10 flights. 44. 15 flights. 44. And so it's been for as long as I can remember. So really, insanity isn't doing something repeatedly and expecting different results. It's knowing that the results will never change that each door leads to the same staircase, to the same number. It's realizing you no longer fall asleep. It's knowing, it's not knowing, rather, whether you've been running for days or weeks or years. It's when the sobbing slowly turns into laughter. Number six. By the way, have any of you seen 1408? Good movie. Number six, my daughter learned to count. My daughter woke me around 11.50 last night. My wife and I had picked her up from her friend Sally's birthday party, brought her home, and put her to bed. My wife went into the bedroom to read while I fell asleep watching the Braves game. Daddy, she whispered, tugging my shirt sleeve. Guess how old I'm going to be next month. I don't know, beauty, I said as I, sli as I sipped on my glasses. As I slipped on my glasses. It's been a while since I've read these, I apologize. Let's, let's back up. Guess how old I'm going to be next month. I don't know, beauty, I said as I slipped on my glasses. How old? She smiled and held up four fingers. It is 7.30 now. My wife and I have been up with her for almost eight hours. She still refuses to tell us where she got them. Oh, the finger she held up. I kind of botched that one, but I hope you get it. How old are you going to be? Four. Four. She won't tell us where she got those damn fingers. Number seven, timekeeper. Promise I'm going to rehearse these. This is just the inaugural episode. We're just having fun getting started. So we're going to break here real quick, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you guys, uh, if you're enjoying these, hit that subscribe button. Maybe head over to Grinch1984. Check out some of the parodies, uh, if that's your bag. And 
uh, maybe subscribe over there too. Because um, there's millions of stories out there, so who knows how many more we're going to read. Number seven, Timekeeper. He had been given the watch on his 10th birthday. It was an ordinary gray plastic rich wrist watch in every respect except for the fact it was counting down. This is all of the time you have left in the world, son. Use it wisely. And indeed he did. As the watch ticked away, the boy, now a man, lived life to the fullest. He climbed mountains, swam oceans, he talked, he laughed, he lived, he loved. The man was never afraid for he knew exactly how much time he had left. Eventually the watch began its final countdown. The old man stood looking over everything he had done, everything he had built. He shook hands with his old business partner. Oh, five, these are the minutes counting. Five, he shook hands with his old business partner, the man who had long been his friend and confidant. Four. His dog came and licked his hand, earning a pat on the head for his companionship. Three, he hugged his son, knowing that he had been a good father. Two, he kissed his wife on the forehead one last time. One, the old man smiled and closed his eyes. Then, nothing happened. The watch beeped once and turned off. The man stood standing there very much alive. You'd think in that moment he would have been overjoyed. Instead, for the very first time in his life, the man was scared. Number eight. There's no reason to be afraid. When my sister Betsy and I were kids, our family lived for a while in a charming old farmhouse. We loved exploring the dusty corners and climbing the apple tree in the backyard. But our favorite thing was the ghost. We called her mother because she seemed so kind and nurturing. Some mornings, Betsy and I would wake up and on each of our nightstands would find a cup that hadn't been there the night before. Mother had left them there worried that we'd get thirsty during the night. She just wanted to take care of us. Among the house's original furnishings was an antique wooden chair, which we kept against the back wall of the living room. Whenever we were preoccupied watching TV or playing a game, mother would inch the chair forward across the room towards us. Sometimes she'd manage to move it all the way to the center of the room. We always felt sad putting it back against the wall. Mother just wanted to be near us. Years later, long after we'd moved out, I found an old newspaper article about the farmhouse's original occupant, a widow. She'd murdered her two children by giving them each a cup of poisoned milk before bed. Then she'd hanged herself. The article included a photo of the farmhouse's living room with a woman's body hanging from the beam. Beneath her, knocked over, was that old wooden chair placed exactly in the center of the room. Mother. Number nine. The perfect plan. On Monday, I came up with the perfect plan. No one even knew we were friends. On Tuesday, he stole the gun from his dad. On Wednesday, we decided to make our move during the following day's pep rally. On Thursday, while the entire school was in the gym, we waited just outside the doors. It, I was to use the gun on whoever walked out first. Then he would take the gun and go into the gym blasting. I walked up to Mr. Quinn, the guidance counselor, and I shot him in the face three times. My God, I didn't realize how... I, I should have read through these. I shot him in the face three times. He fell back into the gym dead. The shots were deafening. We heard screams in the auditorium. No one could see us yet. I handed him the gun and whispered, your turn. He ran into the gym and started firing. 
I followed a moment after. He hadn't hit anyone yet. Kids were scrambling and hiding. It was mayhem. I ran up behind him and tackled him. We struggled. I wrenched the gun from out of his hands. Turned it on him and killed him. I closed his mouth forever. On Friday, I was anointed a hero. It was indeed the perfect plan. Number 10. Warrior of Gold. If God exists, why is there so much evil in the world? It's a common question, but it is misplaced. All things must have balance, light and dark, good and evil, sound and silence. Without one, the other cannot exist. So if that's true, then God does nothing to fight evil? That might be your follow-up question. Of course he fights evil relentlessly. I am D'Artalian? I am D'Artalian. I guess that's his name. One of his most holy and righteous angels. Okay, D'Artalian. I roam the earth, disposing of evil wherever I find it. I kill the monsters you don't ever want to know about. I crush them completely so you can sleep at night. You humans have no idea how many of you live because of the works I do. The work I do, sorry. But what about Stalin, Hitler, Ted Bundy, Jack the Ripper? Well, those are minor ones I had to let live for balance. The ones I destroy are too horrible and vile to survive. What's funny is, while I would wager you have never heard the name D'Artalian in any religious texts, I bet you have heard of me. Americans, for example, have their own name for me. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. Hmm. A lot of people say, boy, if I could go back in time and kill him, he's an infant. You know, apparently D'Artalian is, uh, taking them out, the ones that are far worse than we could ever imagine. This has been Grinch After Midnight. I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Please, please comment below and let me know what you think because your comments, your contributions are going to shape future episodes as I grow this uh, infant sister channel. Don't let this channel die a sudden infant death, please. I'll see you next Friday hopefully with some input and hopefully with a few subscribers. If uh, you're part of the, uh, the Grinch community and you came over from the, pre the preview promo video I did this morning, thank you, welcome. Uh, if you're new to this because you just happened to stumble upon it, thank you for watching. We'll see you next Friday after midnight with the next set of 10 stories. And uh, like I said, if you're new to this channel, and you've never seen Grinch 1984's parodies, head on over there. Just Google Grinch with a Y, Grinch 1984, you'll find me. See you next week. Good night, horror fans. Thanks for watching.